What's up, y'all? On today's show, I get to interview Kato J, author, YouTuber from South Africa. We have an awesome conversation, talk a lot about writing, about what she's doing now, about her process and how she gets into it. Stick around, stay tuned. It's a fantastic interview. Just sitting here watching some Kato J. Welcome back to my channel. Also, if you're new here, I post new adaptation related videos every week. And today is officially the start of a dragon themed February. Kato J, thank you so much for joining me on the Uniweb interview show. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. Did I freak you out with that weird <laughs> jump in? <laughs> no, it was okay. It was uh, quite entertaining. Excellent. That's what I was going for. We're having some weird uh, interference with the video. You're like turning purple. Ooh, Is it like wow. that on your side? No, it, to me it looks fine. Um, I don't know. There you go. Back to normal. Is it okay? You uh, look like a purple yeah. <laughs> Okay, well. Um, it's better enjoy, now. Enjoy the face if it's if it goes back to that way. Okay. I'll, yeah, that's fine. Are you okay? So you are not an alien, uh, not a purple <laughs> alien. Um, Kato J. You are actually from South Africa, is that correct? Yes, that is. And I'm speaking to you, you're in South Africa right now. Yeah, which is why this, I have such terrible internet quality. Is it internet, is the internet terrible in South Africa? Is it like all over? Yeah. No, Who do you guys have, bad. AT&T or is it? Yeah, we don't, we don't really have fiber generally. So. Are y'all just... still like on? dial up and stuff or what no way yeah is it like dsl yeah wow how do you okay that's incredible well i'm so i'm so excited to talk to you though from south africa this is my first time talking to anybody from south africa um i've got some friends from north africa like tunisia and whatnot but it's my first time talking so very very cool um Kato J, part of the writing community on Twitter is how we met. Um, you're also a YouTuber, but you are an author and you're currently writing a book, correct? Yep. Awesome. Yeah, I'm currently so, tell me about this. <laughs> um, so it's a like fantasy. I'm still trying to decide if it falls under the YA category. So I'm hoping that once I get some betas, they'll maybe be able to tell me what they feel about the book um but yeah right now i'm in the first editing phase so there's still a lot of work to do and yeah it's about a guy who i don't want to say too much but he wants to be a knight and for reasons pertaining to his society he isn't allowed to be a knight so yeah it's, it's All a these bit rooms. weird, but yeah. That's cool. I love writing about knights is so fun. So this is set in like medieval times and... It's, it's kind of like because of the way the society developed, it's like medieval mixed with the 1800s. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit different. Do you have a title yet? <laughs> Uh, the working title at the moment is the seek, uh, Seeking the Prophet, but um, seeking, yeah. seeking the Prophet. Seeking the Prophet, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'll ha probably have to change it. I haven't really like look, looked up in terms of copyright issues or so on. I just like to choose a working title, you know, for, for the editing process and writing process and so on beforehand. Yeah. So, I um, I actually wrote a, I wrote a book about a knight, my first my first book, and it was 
it's funny you say like he he was having trouble like trying to become the knight because of societal things and whatnot. Like my my knight was a zombie, and he had to. <laughs> he was the son of Sir Lancelot that got killed, and oh. he came back to life as a zombie and had to prove his worth, um, <laughs> so he could stay a knight and stay. It was it was a stupid story. It's fun. I, I enjoyed it, but that's uh, that's cool that you're writing something like that. I'm sure it's not anything like what I did, but I'm sure it's totally different. But it just it just sounded. So you've written through one edit or one first your first draft. How did the first draft go? Yeah. Um, it went incredibly fast. I I mean, for me. Um, because I was writing another um, work in progress up until, yeah, up, up until the end of October last year. Um, and in a year's time, I'd only progressed about 7,000 words into the story. And I like the idea of it, but I just had trouble writing it. And then Nanarimo came, and my friends and I had all agreed we would do Nanarimo. And then um, the first day came, I did my 1,700 words. And uh, th then I just couldn't imagine having to do 30 days of that. So I, I like abandoned it. And yeah. I did another 1,700 words of an entirely new story. And then like 30 days later, I was 50,000 words in. And I finished the first draft in January so that's like crazy for me like three months I can't I can't even imagine it so yeah is this is this your first the first book you you're writing or have you written other short stories or books before um I've written quite a few other books before but none that I like would put out into the public um you know it was it was kind of just like that developmental writing that you naturally do um so i think if i had to if i had to count i'd say i've oh sorry um i'd say i've completed about nine stories oh cool um, but yeah this is the first one that i'm like okay th this feels like a worthwhile idea to push through and i think my writing's come to a point where it's okay to send it out into the universe and let people judge it. So, so you haven't you haven't uh, put any of the other nine stories out at all? Um, I did fan fiction, but like, I mean, that's kind of like you're behind a veil and they don't know like who you are, which is yeah. kind of safe. So, um, yeah, so I, I did two of those, but um, what yeah, was the not, fan not um, one was Harry Potter, and yeah. the other one was Danny Phantom. <laughs> Danny Phantom, I remember that show. That's awesome. I love that show. So yeah, so that was it's very random, but anyway. No, that's great. So I want to dig in too because I love Harry Potter. Um, huge mm -hmm. Harry Potter fan. You're a Hufflepuff. I'm totally a Gryffindor because yeah. I'm a hero. Duh, but. <laughs> What uh, what was the story about? Um, I don't want to give too much away because I'm afraid someone might find it. <laughs> uh, but it was like a, uh, you know, a it was a crossover, and so I had the other characters like also joining in on Hogwarts in the fifth year and like figuring everything out. Like, I, I did some some things where I got back at Umbridge because she annoyed me so much in the, origin, the original books. <laughs> yeah, so I was, like, living the dream, torturing her. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hear so many writers talk about that, like, with people they despise or, like, people, even people in real life they meet, they make them characters in their book so they can, like, get some comeuppance, you know, so they can take out their frustration on them. Is that something you do uh, regularly? No, I've, I, now that you mention it, I've never done it to people I, like who I have in real life. It's only characters that really frustrate me that like I would ever 
want to do something like that with Arun. Like, I don't know, it's just not a, a instinct to do that with people I know, but like the characters already exist in a book world. So it just, you know, it seems almost more natural. I don't know. Than adding a real human being. Yeah. So yeah. No, I've never actually inserted any people into my stories that I that I know. Like all of them have no basis in reality. Really? Mm. That's amazing. See, because <laughs> it's no, it's interesting to me because like all the characters in my books are based off of at least some sort of characteristics I see in other people. You know what I mean? Like. Ah, uh, yeah. But but like I mean yeah I have this like I have one maybe I have like one strong characteristic that I take from people that I see but it's not you know it's not a character in its entirety it's it's more just one essence of someone someone that stood out to me and then I take that and I put it into a new character and the rest of it has no pertinence to right the person I took that from. So it's, yeah, it's more just the fact that the people I know made me aware of those characteristics. And sure. so, so, but yeah, I don't like, I don't have my friends secretly on my book and just renamed it or like my worst enemy from high school or whatever. Yeah, I think it depends on the person, right? Because, um, like, how much of it are you using for therapy? Like, because <laughs> I feel like for myself, like, my my books were like super therapeutic for me and fictionalizing a lot of characters in my life and being able to write and process that out in a fiction landscape where nobody was getting hurt or it was all it was all safe it was like a safe playground kind of deal but i think that's individual to the writer right mm. yeah and like there's some people i know who take from real life experience real life people and so on and like they really just make it work, and I'm just not one of those people. Like I don't know the type of people that I would write about. So like okay. my the type of people I usually usually write about are very serious and like or, or extremely sarcastic, but in like the worst way. <laughs> Um, and like my friends and I are just not like that, so. So would you consider yourself a goofy person? Eh? A goofy person? Like somebody who's silly and goofy? Yeah, but but usually only with, like, friends. Like, I don't tend to, like, be extremely off-kilter out in the open. So. No? Yeah. Does it make you feel awkward and weird? Yeah, and like it, it kind of has that thing of like everyone's watching. Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like yeah, like now. Like but now, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Don't be weird now. Just be weird. It's great. Um, but I think it more just has to do with my level of comfort, and like yeah. usually. If I'm around friends, then that level is extreme. So then I can like be goofy, even if there's random people watching me. But if I'm on my own or with my mom, then I'm tend to be more reserved. Oh, let's see, that's it's it's interesting that you're like that too, because you're also a YouTuber, so you're on camera a lot. So you have to now for people who don't know, what kind of what kind of YouTube channel do you have? Um, so it's an adaptation based channel, so I kind of like, it's a, it's a bit of everything where I sometimes discuss like how I could see a book that hasn't yet been adapted, be adapted and hopefully a, be a success and not be one of those adaptations that you look at and you're like, yes, this was totally inspired by the movie, I can see that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, and then, like, also, I, I sometimes look at various adaptations. So, if there was, like, for example, there's the Avatar, the Last Airbender movie, mm -hmm. then there's the cartoon that it was inspired by, and then there's the Netflix one that's coming out soon. Right. And, and, like, if, 
you know, when it comes out, I might do a comparison of which which adaptation did it better, kind of like that. Yeah. Um, so it depends, but it's all adaptation focused. Um, I do some, uh, t you know, TV series analysis, movie analysis. I recently did one for How to Train Your Dragon 2 because How to Train Your Dragon 3 is coming out soon. So, like, I wanted to celebrate because I love that series so much. It's really um, good. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Um, but yeah, so like, I do whatever I fancy really, but all adaptation related. And how did you get into that? What was what was the driving factor behind wanting to do that? Um, I studied film um, in in university. I got a degree in that. Um, and like one of the main things that things that we talked about was film theory. Um, and then I did screenwriting, and we did like a few um, assignments where we had to do adaptations. And I've always been that person who gets so annoyed when they don't do the adaptations correctly. Um, so I felt like, you know, that, that was my place in the world, is critiquing other people's adaptations and like hopefully showing that like you can do it better. It's not that like the movie is too short or they didn't have a you know I yeah. don't know but it it gets frustrating especially when you know it's not that the book was 600 pages long the script writer just or the director more likely just didn't want to do it the way that the book did it right so, are you pretty yeah. are you pretty uh, cutthroat and cold hearted when you do these reviews i've i've watched a couple so i have an idea but like do you do you like to go in hard and really Stick it to these idiots that mess up the movies. No, I, I try not to be too harsh. Like, I don't, I don't tend to be too harsh. Like, I have to be really, really, really annoyed. Like, I did the cursed child, and I think I was pretty annoyed at that point. The cursed, <laughs> the, the book, right? Like, did you, did you do the review for the book or the adaptation to the theater? No, I did. I did a review for the book, and I kind of did a not a fix it discussion, but something along those lines of like what I think um, with major issues and how they could have like not had that be an issue. Can I ask? So, can I ask something that bothered me really bad about that book, real quick? Because I'm like a huge Harry Potter fan, and like when that book came out, I was like, yes, they're continuing the story. Now I, I hate the magical beast. I'm sorry, the movies are terrible, but. My opinion, my opinion, mm -hmm. not yours, mine. Um, so in the book, The Cursed Child, I got to the part where they're jumping off the train to Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. And apparently this yeah. trolley witch is like this monster who can like, is incredibly powerful and like doesn't let kids get off the train. Like what, where did this come yeah. from? Did that, did that piss you off? Like it may, excuse my language, did that make you upset like it did me? Because I was like, forget this, man. <laughs> what is going on? Oh my soul, but there were so many things that just like threw right out the window. Like they basically lost me with Albus and Harry's feud. Because you're not telling me that the person who was abused his entire life will treat his son like that. Like yeah. no way. Right. What? So anyway, yeah, so yep. I, I get pretty flustered by that. It's like J.K. Rowling was supposed to be like involved in that writing, but it seems like she just kind of skimmed through it and was like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Whatever. Or she just didn't and, care. Yeah, and it's like no shade to fan fiction writers. Like, as I said, I did my own fan fiction thing, but like that felt like a badly written fanfic. Like, there was no grounds in reality yeah. with that. The guy just did his own thing and I. Um, I say, say in my review of The Cursed Child, I said, like, I don't mind if they were, like, inspired by or, um, you know, in contribution or if it was, like, you know, meant to be a memento to Harry Potter but right. not accepted as canon, I wouldn't have been as harsh on it. But because they tried to slap that canon label on it, yeah. I was no there's no way there's too many like potholes and flaws and 
everything just not working out. Yeah, it's that deviation from it that was just yeah. like, okay, you're just adding stuff that was not like you you're you're not even you're not even building on the world anymore. You're just creating new new worlds kind of kind of idea. Yeah. Um and I feel like but I feel like that's something Magical Beast was, has been doing too and maybe it's just the character who plays the main character in the movie that I I'm not a great fan of. I think he's a wonderful actor, but I can't understand a word he says <laughs> half the time because he he mumbles everything. Um I actually really enjoyed um, the first one. The second one, I had a lot of issues with. Um, but like, I think why it doesn't bother me as much is because it's not in Britain. It doesn't have to do with the magical world that we really know. Right. So, like, I can overlook a lot more. Okay. Um, yeah, but, it's more but yeah. Yeah, to each his own. I know a lot, a lot of people are divided about it, and like I, I enjoy it, but I'm not that diehard about it that I'd be like, <gasps> you know, what kind of person are you if you don't like it? <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure this is gonna get some hate from people. Hopefully, I hope it does. They can. Yeah. They can attack me. These are my opinions, folks. <laughs> Well, so, um, all right, so you've been, how long have you been doing the YouTube thing for? Um, it's been a bit more than a year. I started in September of 2017. Um, so, yeah, but, I mean, it's been a bit of a wild ride because I started with a fashion travel channel, and I just, like, <clears throat> so, yeah, and then I... You just didn't have the passion for it like you do with film and, and uh, adaptation and stuff? Mm -hmm. Did you just yeah. not have the same passion for, for yeah. stuff? Like, it was the passion. It was like try, kind of running out of ideas with what to do that hasn't already been done a thousand times with a lot better quality than I can afford, you know, afford and provide. Um, yeah. And the other thing is, it's just so expensive because I'm not the kind of person who goes and buys the newest trends and the newest fashions. Like, I go to the sales section and I look at what I can find there, <laughs> and like that cuts it in the fashion world. So hey, I just that could be beneficial to some people if you tell them like where you find your fashion on on discount, like. If that's something you're interested in. I, I find too though that like if you're not following your passion, if you're not doing the things you're passionate about, then you'll burn out quickly. Like if you're writing stuff that you don't like, then your career's not gonna last very long. If you're doing videos about stuff you don't like, like then uploading like doing it to a point where you have you wanna be successful, it's gonna be impossible. You're just gonna give up because it's like there's no joy in it. You know? Yeah. Yeah, no, like I, I never looked at YouTube as like a, you know, this is what I want to do with my life. I, like, writing has always been that thing for me. But I thought YouTube, because writing was always my hobby. And then when I started, like, focusing on writing more and it kind of became not not in my, not really my job because I'm not, like, being paid for it, <laughs> but, like, it became a lot more serious. I needed a new hobby, and YouTube was that for me. And like, if I if I do get some monetization out of it, great. But um, it's it's probably not gonna happen. Um, but I would like some new subscribers. <laughs> it's fun to discuss things, you know. Um, it is. It's like this. I mean, because you do this yeah. on your channel, and, and you you'll have an opportunity with more people watching. To have these yeah. kind of conversations, you know. Yeah, I like. I just, I mean, it's it's more about the engagement. That's something that like really is so nice for me about uh, the writing community on Twitter. Yeah, is all the engagement, the constant like you know just asking asking people how is their novel going? Have they been having a good day? Like all of that. It's just so fun for me. So I'm I'm really glad I found the writing community. Me too. It's uh it's yeah. my entire world, you know, in terms yeah. of uh, 
of what I've been able to do. I mean, making this possible. And I didn't even realize how passionate I would be about this until I started doing it. Like, I love getting to interact with other people and, like, learn from them because you've got a ton of experience in writing and YouTubing and, and, and different aspects of the world, the way you look at it, your perspective is different. And, like, the opportunity for me to get to learn that um, during an interview and during a conversation is, is, like, awesome. And that wouldn't be possible without the writing community. Yeah. It is, yeah, it's, it's very awesome. Um, so what are you currently – you're currently working on your novel – are you doing edits like every day? I know you just said you just got a new job as well, so congratulations on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, you told me, and your job is something that like it's been my dream job for a long time. <laughs> like if I could have a job, that would be that would be it. Like that's the only place I could see myself wanting to work for a long period yeah. of time. Yeah. No. Okay. And that that was the thing is because um, like as I said, I studied film, so. Naturally, I looked at like the film side of things, the film industry, and so on when I was looking for jobs. But like our economy is just not not on at the moment, so that's not an option really. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, where else would I be extremely happy? And obviously, a bookstore was was the answer to that. So yeah, yeah. I think you, and I think in the writing community, there's like. Uh, most of us would love because a bookstore is like a magical place it's like with all, yes. filled with all these incredible thoughts and ideas of other people who are like tapped into this something outside mm -hmm. of themselves that write speaking of which when you write is it something that you plan out or is it something that you feel like you you kind of get into a flow to where you're being channeled through and you're you're writing that way um i don't know for me it's kind of like a a puzzle that like I kind of just get handed the building blocks without seeing them beforehand I don't know how to say it because like I, I do this thing where I need to know what the climax for my story is uh -huh. and then as I write the rest will fall into place but if I don't have my climax then I have nowhere to go Oh, wow. So you start with like the most exciting, the thing that's the pivotal point in the story, and then you work around it that way, like from opposite sides. Yeah. Well, usually I'll, I'll work backwards. Um, okay. Then, but also usually I do do an outline. Um, so I will start with the climax. I'll do like an outline and then I'll start from the beginning writing through to the end. So, yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's not like it's not completely like a plotter, but it's also not completely panting. So yeah, there's got it. Yeah, there's a nice medium, right? Yeah. I feel like um, the camera's kind of falling off. There you go. Um, I feel like I've like if you go too far panster style, like I've done in the past. Then you're basically you're you're trying to write yourself into corners, and then you're just getting wilder and wilder and wilder, and like yeah. at some point you start losing the the theme of the story. And I noticed I was doing that, like I where I had to be like, okay, that's not the theme. Like I understand, like there's got to be some direction <laughs> because yeah. otherwise it's just like absolute insanity, at least for me. Yeah, because my thing is like I used to be that person who like plotted out everything and knew everything about her characters beforehand and like i'd spend months if not years on just like the character biographies and like getting to know my characters while actually only just procrastinating um yeah. and the, so that's why i know like you know going in completely knowing everything just doesn't work for me. I need to have a basic outline and then I'll discover everything else along the way. So it was so interesting because I knew what was going to happen, but like getting to know my characters as I was writing was just fascinating for me because I, there, there were some things about their lives that like I'd write, then I'd go to bed and then the next morning I'm like, oh, this could work, and then it just fits in so perfectly with the rest of the story. Yeah, 
that's that's neat. So, so is it is it something that you work every single day on writing, or do you have like a certain amount of words you like to write, um, or how um, do you go about that? You turn well, with, with the actual writing, I did um, word counts targets. So um, for example, in November, obviously, I had the fifty thousand word mark, and then in December I thought I would do the 30,000 but then I was like oh it's vacation maybe 20,000 and then I actually did manage to do the 30,000 that I originally planned on and yeah. then January I was just like I need to finish this I didn't know how many words it would take to finish it but I could kind of feel I was close to the end so I just uh -huh. said okay by the end of January I need to finish this and then um, I knew I had to take a month off. That was like, because I like to do research on like what the best practices are. So um, the most recommended was that you take off a month after your first draft. So I finished on the 15th of January and then I took off a month and I started the 15th of February now, Friday, last Friday. So how does it feel getting back into it? Does it feel weird getting back into the story? Oh, it's, it's so painful. It's, Why? Because I feel like highlighting every single se sentence. It's like, no, this isn't good enough. This isn't good enough. This isn't good enough. <laughs> and it's just like I'm, I'm not going to have anything left by the end of it. Yeah, so, I know. And I've I've read a lot of books about it, and I know Stephen King's book is really famous on writing about like cutting twenty percent or whatever it is to of your of your writing of your original, and I feel like that's so much. Like that's <laughs> I'm like, but it's it's I guess it's necessary, right? Like we have to we have to look at, and I think that's why we have to take a month off from it or a little bit longer, however long it is, to get that objective eye. Right to be able to like because we grow we grow a lot as we as we learn uh, throughout the months as we write and do other projects. Yeah, yeah and but I do think like twenty percent for me might be a bit too much because I am an underwriter. Um, so I feel like a lot of what I remove, I, I need to replace with more quality words. Yeah. Um, so, because I, when I underwrite, I tend to overwrite on things that are completely unnecessary, like every thought and feeling that my main character ever experiences. But yeah. then, like, I completely negate to mention if they enter a room, if there's even anything in the room. Like, yeah. you could be looking at bank space for all the, the poor readers know. So, it's just... Yeah, I need to, you know, that, that's one of the things that I know needs to be looked at. Like, I've added in a editing phase just for, like, adding description. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yes. I've realized I've done the same thing. You, know, you talk about it, underwriting. Yeah, I do the same thing. Like, there's so many scenes that I'm like, I could do so much more with. And, like, I don't need all this extra fluff about, you know, what the character's you know or what like a sub character is thinking at that moment like it doesn't especially if they don't have a play a part at all in the rest of the story it's like just you know adding extra nonsense um yeah. but that's it it's it's the cool thing about writing it's like it's just a progressive thing that we're going to learn new ways new approaches and continually improve hopefully until our very last story is told you know yeah, yeah that's very cool so is this something you're looking to get uh, published traditionally or are you going to go the in independent publishing route? Um, I am first going to look at traditional um, just because I feel like for my current situation in life it's preferable um, if it if I do and I didn't I wouldn't mind going um, in the uh, if if I need to uh, but I just think like I don't really have the funds at the moment to um, go indie and make it a success. Yeah. Um, like I would have to wait at least a year or two. Um, whereas if I'm finished, you know, if I'm done editing to a point where I, I think it's good, 
then um, you know I can immediately submit it to publishing houses for possible consideration because uh, we don't have agents where I'm from. So there's no there's no go between. It's just straight up going to hit up yeah. a publishing house. So are they are they more receptive though there to uh, people coming in and, and handing out some good books? <laughs> I think I think they are relatively receptive, but the problem is the public isn't. Because um, mm -hmm. like uh, our well, my home language is Afrikaans, um, and a lot of people look down on books that are written in my native in my home language uh -huh. but then if you write it in english which is what i write my book in um then there's so much international competition that mm -hmm. most um, publishing houses won't invest in it wow so it's it's kind of tricky i was gonna say it sounds like a fine line you gotta play are you mm. is it something you're looking forward to yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to be terrifying, <laughs> um, yeah. but but I I do have faith in this book. I I I've been listening to a lot of people, you know, stories about how they got published and so on, and like the feeling that they had with a certain novel, and I I kind of feel like I have that feeling with this current novel, like. Yeah. I've been writing for a fair few years. Um, if I, I'm doing the math correctly, I think I've been writing for about 12. Wow. Um, and I've never felt this sure about something. And I, I, it's never come this easily. So wow. I don't know. Yeah, it's, I mean, that intuition you got to kind of listen to every once in a while, right? Because maybe it's leading you in the right direction. Let's hope so. <laughs> hope so so what is the legacy you're looking to leave with your work like 20 30 40 years from now uh, are you like you're youtubing you're writing what would people what are what do you want hope people take away from your work um so it, it's weird i think um maybe just like if, if this is going to sound strange, but it's a big part of a lot of my work I've, I've come to realize, and that's equality in all things. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, not, not just in the normal societal way, but also like in relationships and in the way that you view everyone else's experiences and so on. It's just... Um, especially here in South Africa, there's still a lot of politics going on. I, th I mean, I think the world as a whole is going through a lot of politics, but yeah. um, you know, it, it, there's a, a lot of politics on both sides. And um, I, I just wish there wasn't. I just wish that everyone would see people for being people. Um, and you know, having that mutual respect and everything like that. So, yeah, I think that, that would be an important legacy for me because I think that that's, that's a good way to see eye to eye. Yeah. Yeah, respecting people's experiences, right? Because, I mean, we're so much more than what meets the eye, you know, every yeah. day. It's like, in doing this, I get to meet people that... I would never think I would have something in common with, and then I have a conversation with them, an honest conversation, and I'm like, holy crap, it's just another human being <laughs> that's right. going through going through life, experiencing life, and trying to do it to the best of their ability. And um, I think when we get to that point, that human, that human root, that there's so much peace and understanding at that point that if we could... You know, and I, I say this to everybody, but that's why it's called Uniweb uh, Productions, Uniweb Interviews, because I believe that all of us come together. We're all in this together, um, and, and understanding that is so important for the the raising the level of humanity to another, yeah. you know, to a new understanding of consciousness. That if we can get along, if we can work together and help one another, 
then life can manifest itself into a very beautiful experience. And I'm already seeing that in my own personal life. Yeah, it's yeah. it's great in theory, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's great in theory. It's hard to hard to see, hard to find in real life. It is. Um, yeah. It's one of those and, things. Uh, like, uh, yeah, sorry. I was saying it's like one of those things. Like, how do you even go about it, right? It's just it's such a big a big issue. Yeah, no, and it's weird because um, while I was working today. We discussed like customers and so on and how funny some customers can be, how demanding and so on. Yeah. And um, then like listening to the stories, I'm like, why would people do that? Like, it, I, I, I struggle to comprehend it because I go into a shop and when I, I do this thing where I challenge myself to try and ma make the cashier smile before I leave. Awesome. And like, at least ninety percent of the time, you manage it because it's just like it's infectious. Yeah. And like, I don't, I don't know if that like helps the person throughout the day, but for that one second, it makes a difference. So I don't know why people and, and to tell people it just doesn't make sense. It does, yeah. and, that, and that's another thing, right? It's like we don't know the stories going on behind what's what's up with them, and that's so cool that you do that, though. It's such a that's such a neat neat way and neat perspective to go about um, living your life, is trying to make other people smile. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah so it's, I've been doing... it's just it's so yeah, it's good. Oh, it's good. Uh, I mean, especially yeah. working. You're, you're in customer service too, so having that. Oh, hold on one second. Okay, sorry, I lost it for a second. We're back up. Um, so I also asked you uh, before, like, do you have a certain quote or? Um, can you see me or hear me? Hello. Ah, there you go. Did you, did you lose me for a second? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I lost you for a second. Sorry about that. It's okay. Yeah, I don't know if it's my internet. I really hope it's not, but I suspect it might be. How do you, how do you upload videos to uh, YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> uh, It takes a while. I don't know what the average upload speed is for like you know you guys, but for me, like if I want to do the high quality upload, then it takes anywhere between three hours and twenty four hours. Holy cow. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It takes like it usually takes ten oh, minutes for mine and I freak out. I'm like, what's taking so long? <laughs> Ten minutes. Yeah, I you, wish. you have patience. That's wonderful. We're a patient person. It's forced patience, but um. Sometimes I mean, it's the only way. We're gonna That's awesome. Well, Kato J, um, I thank you so much for coming on yeah. the interview show today. It was great having you on. I'm gonna link mm -hmm. all your your uh, Twitter and your YouTube and all that kind of stuff into the video. Um, is there anything you want to tell the writing community before uh, I let you go? Yeah, um, and um, yeah. Let, let me think. Um, I don't Spot. I don't know. Um, Freestyle freestyle rap. That'll help clear just, the. Chain. I don't. Um, I, I think that um, one thing that I would say is have patience with yourself and um, also always try and, try and improve 
um, but know when to quit. Like, not, not only like when to shelve a book that might not be working for you, but also when you've edited enough and you're just now being way too harsh on yourself and you need to stop and see it for the good work that you've done and not all the small flaws that might still be there. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful advice because we can't, we, we, we're good at picking ourselves apart <laughs> like crazy. You can do it all day long. Well, Kato, thank you so much for, thank you so much for coming on the show. I truly appreciate it. Internet handshake. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. And it was my pleasure. And we will talk to you later, okay? Okay. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thanks. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you would subscribe to the channel and hit that notification for the bell. You know what? We love you. Love you. Love you. You know what?